Last time we discussed the adoption of the Swedish M94, a rare instance of the carbine preceding the rifle. Today we'll untangle the rest of the story with the infantry long arm. Hi, I'm Matthias, and this, ooh, this is a little bit longer than last time. This is the 6.5 millimeter Gevar M96, a Swedish Mauser long rifle. And it's pretty, but I'll leave you to judge that when you look in the light box. At 50 inches in length and weighing 8.8 .8 pounds, this is much more of what we consider to be an infantry long arm. It still chambers the 6.5 by 55 millimeter rimless cartridge, and it has a five round staggered box magazine feeding from a stripper clip. Last time we covered a somewhat lightened history of the Swedish adoption of the Mauser action. This resulted in the M94 cavalry carbine and yet a shortened rifle was not really the center of the trials. It was more of the sideshow. So today I get to rewind the clock just a bit and point out some key features we omitted from those trials. Now, again, I won't be covering every detail, as we have seen the changeover from the Mauser 1889 family of rifles to the now very famous 1893 family all the way back in our Ottoman 1893 episode. And even then we skimmed some of the finer details ones we'll eventually visit when our series makes it to Spain. Specific to Sweden, they had trialed the Mauser 1889 and followed it to the 1892 which is where they did the bulk of their early testing. This again was the missing link between the 89 and 93 and features many of the latter improvements but still fed from a single stack magazine that had not yet come around to the later famous Mauser extractor. You see, one of the greatest failings of the German Commission rifle, their first smokeless gun, an evolution of the earlier black powder Mausers, as imagined by one Louis Schlegelmick, well, it didn't feed so well. Uh, cartridges were snagged by the extractor only after they were placed in the chamber, so in theory, uh, you could bolt a cartridge almost home and then grab another and bolt it right in the back of the first. And if you manage to get to, to primer, well, you could have an out of battery detonation. That is no bueno. Mauser actually became very interested in controlling the feed of the cartridge. On the 1889, the extractor had been over top. So like the commission rifle, it too did not provide a very good controlled feed. During production of the 1891, the extractor would be lowered slightly, which was of little aid. By the time of the Swedish trials though, he had firmly lowered the extractor, so much so that it necessitated a weakening of the right hand locking lug, which was not entirely ideal either, but it did provide a controlled feed right from the time the cartridge left the magazine. And then inspiration struck, wrapping a massive extractor around the lug, not only controlling the feed from the start, but also providing extra strength and longevity. Now we're talking, that is a good grip. Now the majority of those extractor changes and the firing pin improvements we talked about last time would be rolled into an 1892 trials rifle for Sweden. Plus it even has that sweet new flush staggered magazine, super simple with its flat spring and milled follower. But there are some features we're still missing, no thumb piece on the back of the cocking piece, and the barrel bands and bayonet lugs smack of a standard 1893, so at least it turns out the Spanish like them. The cleaning rod has no curves to it, and if we were to zoom in on the receiver we would not see a thumb cut for loading. Now that's about the rough and ready of it before we got to our rifle from last time, the M94 carbine, and on closer inspection we know that gun had a thumb cut and the textured cocking piece, so those came into play by 1894. But this puts us in a curious position because as the carbines are rolling out, Sweden hasn't quite made up their mind on what the final rifle pattern will be, uh, though we can see what they were considering as of 1895. This trials rifle is largely like the final product, but it does have a few bits of weirdness. Barrel band locking springs, a tangent rear sight much more like the Norwegian Krag Jorgensen, funny that. Uh, this wouldn't be abandoned and they'd return to the Mauser pattern, 
as on the carbine plus a little improvement. And they've moved away from the 1893 style bayonet log, which was admittedly not the strongest. Here they seem to be trying something not unlike the Germans' final choice. Honestly, it's way less weird than what they ultimately decided on, but we'll get there in a minute. Instead, let's look at the uh, final rifle as a whole, as it was adopted in March of 1896. Uh, just like this, mostly. All right, we got a much longer gun, so let's start at the front. Clearing rod, front sight with no protector, slight step down at the end of the muzzle. You may see these threaded for blank fire devices and other things. It's a little bit later on, but you just know that you could. The bayonet lug is extremely unique, and so I want to talk about it in a moment. If we keep coming down, we have just the lower stock with no upper handguard. Upper handguard picks up after that lower band. Uh, again, this is slung underside for infantry. So we keep going, we got a big hand rest in here, and this is where we start to get unique from our last rifle because this sight is not quite the same as the other. Normally, our rifle sights are just longer versions of our carbine sights, and this looks the case at first until you pay closer attention. Because while this is a flip-up ladder adjustable sight like we're so accustomed to, uh, in this case, if I get where you can see at least the back side of it, we could adjust it for volley fire all the way from 600 meters up to, I believe, 2,000 on this particular guy. Realistically, most of your shooting is going to be done on this rifle in a lower position. If I get this just right, you'll probably see a series of steps back here. Uh, it might be easier to see it from over top. A series of steps right here. Now, I can adjust this slider, drop this sight back down to put it into one of these steps. And what that does is allows me some adjustment from the 300 meter zero on this gun up to 600 meters here, tangentially adjustable. So this is a tangent adjustable rear relief sight uh, and a ladder sight. So we get the best of both worlds. We have our volley fire position. We have a tangent adjustable sight. It's actually a very smart way of doing this that gives the soldier the most options. Although this system does not have any windage really built into it. So if we work our way back, there is nothing different in this section from the previous gun that stands out. It's the same Mauser 93 style action with the cocking piece changes, safety changes. We obviously have that thumb cut we talked about last time uh, on the side of the receiver there. So realistically, nothing really to cover here from the previous episodes. So if we keep on moving down, we're gonna see two new things here. One of which was uh, right there at the start from the rifle that's again being underslung for infantry use. The other is that this disc on this particular gun has changed. Now, like we saw last time, it should have been a unit marking plate, just like it was on the carbine when this gun was originally put into service. However, there would be some changes. They would later take on a totally different meaning, and we're gonna talk about that more towards the end of the episode. All right, let's go ahead and look under the hood. Let's go through this assuming you have not seen a Mauser 1893, as it's basically the same. First, we'll load our rifle from a stripper clip, five rounds, staggered, and driven by a simple flat spring. As we bolt forward, notice the cartridge rim is immediately guided under the extractor, providing a controlled feed. The trigger has a double humped surface that engages the receiver. This creates a two-stage pull, first the take up, and then the release. The extractor withdraws the spent casing from the chamber and pulls it into the ejector mounted in the left side of the receiver, flicking the casing from the action. Note this rifle cocks on close, with the cocking piece snagging on the sear as the bolt is driven home. When released, it allows the firing pin to spring forward. The bolt body does, however, slightly cam the cocking piece back when we open the action. This is just enough to retract the firing pin. Engaging the safety accomplishes two things. The rotating wedge-like rear cams the cocking piece back slightly and keeps it from dropping, while at the front, an extension engages the bolt body, preventing it from being rotated and locking the bolt shut. It's worth noting the Swedish 1894 has a second notch, which allows the safety to be used with a gun decocked. Looking back at the sear, we'll see an extension at its front. This pin fits in a recess in the bolt body only when the action is closed and locked preventing out a battery fire. Otherwise, this gun has the usual locking lugs, guide lug, and other Mauser features we've come to enjoy. 
so check out some of our other episodes to learn more of how it developed. All right, there's one final piece of our tour that we have missed, and of course, it's right up here, the bayonet lug. It's pretty unique on this gun, and there's a little bit to talk about there, so let's take a closer look. Now, normally we don't do bayonets on this show, but this one stands out as a little bit more different than the others, and it's kind of hard not to mention when talking about this gun. Also, it was available. So, uh, it's an all-steel construction. Everything in front of you that you see is steel, which is very unique. It's also a short bayonet. Now, this was adopted in late 1897 and retroactively named the model 1896, and it stayed in service for the entire life of the 1896 rifle, which is pretty cool. Now, if I pop this guy open, you'll see this one's had a little bit of wear and poor storage, but you get the idea. We've got double-sided with a fuller down the center. The shank on this is actually pretty short, and so there'd be complaints about these being easily broken uh, compared to some others that have sort of full tangs. That's debatable. Uh, we have a little bit of a cross guard, nothing crazy. It's actually tipped rearward so that it gives you a, a firm grip up against your knuckle and it hopefully doesn't snag on brush nearly as bad. This is actually a very thoughtful bayonet. Now the way it works that's so unique is the fact that it is hollow bodied. So it's just a big old tube down in there and that allows it to get over the clearing rod. It allows it to get over a projection on the bayonet lug for this gun. So if we look, uh, we're gonna have our muzzle ring on this reduced step in the muzzle. We're going to have this body cover our clearing rod easily, even if there's a little bend in it like this one has from storage over the years. And then at this root, there's this metal lug that's actually going to shim up on that, or not shim up, but rather fill up that hole. And then there's a notch right here, round notch, it's gonna catch where this little circle doohickey is on this bayonet. So let me show you how simple this is. You just put it over, click, she's on. So it's very easy to attach and it's extremely easy to detach. You just pull this little guy here and pop her forward. Now, I think this is somewhat remarkable because if you've done any collecting of old military rifles and tried to shove, say, a Mauser bayonet on any other Mauser, uh, Generally, you're gonna find out just how dirty that bayonet had gotten over the past hundred years. And if you're lucky enough to get it all the way on, you're gonna have a heck of a time getting it all the way back off. Uh, I've known a lot of people, you know, put holes in their ceilings or walls or hands trying to get old bayonets unstuck from rifles they just shoved them onto without properly, I mean, deeply cleaning them out. Well, if a hundred years of grime can do that, then what does, you know, just like six months of combat? like? Is there some advantage here? Because this system seems like you could practically pack it with mud three quarters of the way up and it'd still be fine because it really isn't that much metal going into a much larger volume. And then this little tab just has to click into that little dimple. So I guess if this dimple caked up, you'd have some problems, but that's easy enough to blow out. So maybe I'd have to do some more testing, but it does seem like a very unique approach to the bayonet issue uh, and one that we haven't seen before. So I wanted to make sure I talked about that to some degree. And while we're looking at the lug here, something else is going to weird. I mean, this has bothered me for a while. There's a hole here, an intentional hole. I have to say it, something is up with this bayonet beyond the obvious. You don't get this weird without a reason and yet, even in the excellent book, Crown Jewels, I have not found a clear explanation, but I did find a clue. There was brief mention of a monopod. And if you scour the internet, a handful of images of a device like this one turn up. One stored at Aberdeen even has a ski pole basket attachment. If you look at how this monopod is configured, it uses the otherwise unexplained hole in the bayonet lug and it folds backwards in such a way as to not disturb the bayonet itself. Or maybe I'm completely wrong, and someone will come along with the data to smack me back down to the ground. And that's why history is fun. Anyway, this Model 96 bayonet was entirely satisfactory and not at all entirely satisfactory. Basically, it served almost entirely unmodified for the life of the Swedish Mauser, and yet its attachment was sort of weak. We certainly didn't see any attempt to keep its mounting mechanism when the carbine got a bayonet all its own. In fact, there was a trial to replace the 96 bayonet in 1915, but this proved to be not worth the effort in the end. All right, I've punished you enough with history. Let's let May take a few shots with this beautiful thing.
I am one bayonet away from being able to take out a light fixture. All right. Uh, Sweden has a long rifle on paper, but they have to make it. Licensed production began at Carl Gustav Stad in 1898, with only roughly 3,200 rifles being completed in that year. If that seems a bit of a late start in the game, you are correct. Machinery, delivery delays, and other complications did stall Swedish efforts. So Mauser Obendorf would get another contract, this time for 38,600 rifles starting in 1899 and delivering through 1900. Overall, roughly 514,000 Swedish M96 long rifles would be produced through 1925, which is when serial production largely stopped. 18,000 more would be produced by Husqvarna during World War II, but that's another story for another time, one where I get to introduce another model. Being a neutral nation, I have to do something to integrate this episode into the Great War, so let's talk stocks. First, they were all too long, by roughly 8 to 10 millimeters, so in 1903 they were shortened up a bit. The original wood for the M96 and carbines would be French walnut, but with the disruption of supply in World War I, Sweden would have to use their own domestic woods or whatever else they could get a hold of. This would include things like red beech, maple, elm, ash, oak, European walnut, and American walnut. They were all tried on for size, but ultimately red beech won out as the best alternative, though you had to be careful about not storing it naked. Uh, without being fitted to a rifle, it tended to kind of warp and it was hard to get back into shape. Uh, closing in on the World War II era, there would be further changes, which led to the M38 shortened rifles, which I'll explain another day. Just know that some M96 were ultimately converted to this pattern, and so not all of them live to this day. Now, while I'm trying to not dig too deep into post-1920s Swedish Mausers, I know a lot of you are seeing some funny-looking discs that don't line up with what we talked about last episode. And if you're wondering what all this means, well, these guys were added in the 40s, replacing the original unit discs. You see, the Norwegians had adopted a Spitzer bullet back in 1925, but Sweden had taken a lot longer, mostly because the ballistic advantages of a Spitzer are not as strong when you started with a flat shooting 6.5mm bottlenose to begin with. But with the introduction of the uh, Model 41 cartridge, Sweden would have to update their rifles, changing out thousands and thousands of rear sights, or not. Uh, they could just mark the difference in holdover on the stock disc. So this region displays the difference in impact. They also started including inventory data like muzzle diameter on last inspection and level of rust or pitting. If you'd like to interpret your rifle, I recommend checking out our reading list. It's also not uncommon to find a range plate fixed to the stock, which again helps the shooter manually correct for that Model 41 cartridge. You can't lose the manual if it's bolted to the gun. All right, that's the gun wrapped up pretty well, but what about the soldiers, the, the service life, the use? Well, just because they were neutral, that doesn't mean Sweden didn't have an army. As a matter of fact, they had a form of conscription since at least 1812, and it maintained an all-conscript army since 1901. Between 1885 and 1941, this was divided into the Linden and the Landstormen. The Linden were the regular army field units, as well as the Navy and later Air Force, and represent the younger members of the armed forces. Generally, they were under 30 years of age, to give you a rough idea. The older soldiers wound up in the Landstermen, which were attached to regular infantry regiments and fielded in the same region in which they were mustered. Uh, these Landstermen were defensive-oriented troops, which often used reduced or older equipment. Now, of course, that is a very rough sketch of the Swedish army, but that's all we really need, as Sweden wasn't going to be a participant in either of these great wars, not in a way that requires that kind of definition. Uh, there were, however, Swedes in both of those conflicts, and what may surprise you is that some Swedish Mausers were arguably in the Great War. In 1918, with the collapse of the Russian Empire, Finland emerged as an independent nation, one that was politically divided. 
Yep, we're talking about the good old story of the Reds versus the Whites, the Communists versus a mix of largely conservative political organizations, and of course it broke out into a proper civil war. Due to the location, rifles in this conflict include the Mosin, Winchester 1895, Copius Arisaka, and our Swedish Mauser. These arrived through a variety of back channels always attributable to private purchase, I'm certain. But ultimately, it's unlikely more than 1,000 arrived, making them a bit of a drop in the bucket. The war ended with a white victory, and Finland was going to move into the German sphere of influence, taking on a German-related monarch, but then Germany sort of lost the whole war and all of its political prestige, so independence will just have to do. All available Swedish Mausers were then transferred to the Finnish Civil Guard, where they became a favorite of target shooters. Eventually, nearly 1,400 would wind up in inventory, plus additional rifles in private hands of citizens. By 1939, it's estimated just shy of 2,000 were in the country before the Winter War. That number was bulked up by the direct purchase of 77,000 more, surplused and sold from Sweden. Up to another 8,000 rifles were carried over by the Swedish Volunteer Corps, and many of these remained in use through the Continuation War, even after the Swedes had gone home. Upwards of 1,000 carbines seem to have made it into Finland as well. That makes them a bit of a rare sight compared to the long rifles. Generally, Swedish Mausers in Finland were issued to the northern regions, coastal artillery, anti-aircraft, home guard, all the, the rear action guys, freeing up standard 7.62 chambering guns, Mosins, for the front line. Uh, but despite the secondary use, uh, I'd sure be pretty satisfied with being stuck with this gun. In 1951, Finland sold off the Mausers as surplus, and so you can sometimes find them in the market with a telltale SA marking. That just stands for Finnish Army. Whew, okay. We made it through our first set of neutral episodes, and we even saw a bit of wartime use, despite the fact that it's a neutral power. Nice. All right, let's go over to May and get her opinion on handling what might be one of the most elegant rifles we've seen to date. Now this time around we have had to make a little extra room because not only do we have May, but this is a long rifle. Let me go ahead and tip that guy over into your hands. Look at that. Now, we are backwards because we are covering the long <laughs> rifle second, which is just so weird for Yeah, me. it's weird to go from the carbine to the long rifle. It's but it's, it's smart. Different. It is. I, I absolutely say it is smart and is the way a lot of armies should have done it because we see issues in infantry long arms that get often sorted by the time they go to the cavalry. The cavalry represents a small percentage of the force. Uh, that, I, I can't disagree like, with that. Congratulations, Sweden. This was the smartest thing I've seen in a while. Yeah. So, it's too bad it wasn't used in the war. <laughs> now, May, what's it like? Neutral. <laughs> Good job. Thank you. Uh, what's it like handling this Swedish 1896, which you have obviously never handled before doing this show? It's not like this is Susie's personal firearm that she's owned for a decade and has been around this building since who knows when. It's not like you've seen it like a hundred times and it finally gets its own episode. You know, I totally never shot this gun before. What is this? Is it a gun? <laughs> I don't even know. Uh, let's get into it. But no, really, yes, we have had this one for quite a while, so this was not my first experience with it. Obviously, fairly long. A good bit of weight to it. Balance is actually good. It's That's right impressive. there in the center. I don't know, I'm yeah, it's, it's actually it's right there in the center. It's not too bad, is it? I thank you. Yes, it does deserve that. Also, <laughs> beautiful blonde boy. Can we talk about that? All the fun colors these guys come in. Oh my like god! First Pokemon. of all, can anybody <laughs> see this right now? Because I feel like it's blending into the background. Where it's is? it's yellow on yellow. <laughs> um, did you want to tell them about the fact that so we had photography for this done years ago? God. And then you went to pull it for this episode. Yep. Well, also, okay. So, so that's it's twofold essentially. One, our photography attempts have improved. So we, we tinkered with lighting and stuff like that and gotten colors balanced better. So there was one improvement there I knew was going to be a thing. And sure enough, when I confirmed the old photos, the unedited ones, I was like, yeah, no, those were too red. And then two, 
oh my god, brief photographing even with that improvement, it's still, it's difficult to get the colors on this one balancing out just right without oh, it abuses things the blowing camera. out. It's because it's so yellow. It's just, it's so bright. I don't even know if it appears that bright on the normal camera, but like, man, it is hard to get this one to it, even out, but I did it. It looks oversaturated <laughs> in real life. Yes. Like, I'm looking at it's yellow with like red... And it looks... And then this, like, black almost with the sight. Like... Yeah, it, the, it is an interesting piece. And this is not the only thing. Like, you can find these in dark. You can find them in light. You can find them in sort of a plum. So collect all those Pokemon, man. <laughs> and it has to do with Sweden trying out so many different kinds of stocks, like we talked about. Mm -hmm. And so collecting Swedish Mausers, they can be some of the most beautiful rifles because of just how much diversity there was in the wood. Mm. Uh I just wanted to make sure I mentioned just this. It just It's a gorgeous rifle. And the fact that we've had this one for like a decade. Oh, Suze will never give it up. Uh, no, there's no way. But it's beautiful. It's been one of our favorite ones to keep around, too. Yeah. Okay. So aside from being beautiful, um, <laughs> it's long. Yep. It's balanced well. Surprisingly long, yes. How's the weight for a gun that is pushing 50 inches? Like this is in, we're not as big as, but we're in that sort of lapel size. Mm -hmm. How is it? Is it lapel weights or does it feel a lot lighter? Mm, I, I, honestly, I don't feel like it's that bad. It's maybe it's because unlike with a LaBelle, the weight isn't changing whenever I've got it loaded. Right. Like it's not changing. It's not too bloated. It's, it's the weight is only added right here the in rear. the center to the rear slightly. So it's really not that bad. It's it's not that it doesn't feel like the weight's unmanageable. No, to, to me, the 96 is probably one of the most elegant long rifles out there. It reminds me also of say like, the Romanian 1892 rifles, that sort of narrow yeah, and long. Yeah, I can see that. And it is narrow. It does have a good narrowness to yeah. it as well, so. Okay, so when you put it up to your shoulder, what are you feeling here? So, yeah, putting it up to my shoulder. I'm not feeling a semi-pistol grip. We're never going to get that. I'm never going to win. Do you know what made these amazing? Semi-pistol grip. No. <laughs> You're never going to have your perfect gun. <laughs> That's okay. One of these days, I'll have dreams. Mm -hmm. Again. Um, but no, yep, no semi-pistol grip, unfortunately. Um, comb height. Really, again, same with the carbine, I would say. It's a good placement. I don't think they should go any higher, though. I think it's right there where it needs to be. Finger grooves, we still got them. Um, They're very long. They are incredibly long, but to be fair, long rifle. Uh, you would expect them to be longer. Not necessarily. I think they're giving you a selection of places to keep your hand. I do like options. I am a girl that does like options. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Go up and down. Mm -hmm. Oh, so nice. Yep. Um, but no, I did. that's perfectly fine and reasonable. I guess if you just want a little extra room to grip. Yeah, I can't see yeah, that being a bad thing. There's a lot of weight to it, so I could. that's eh, understandable. And we've still got the, uh, the foregrip here in front of the sight, which is great. I've still got room to grab the gun without having to grab any metal anywhere, because again, they do get warm. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, not too bad there in terms of the wood and placement of things on here. Uh, getting into the action. So we've still got... It's the same. Yeah, pretty much. No three different... Except that bolt handle. Yeah, the bolt handle is just different, except, you know, straight or a state straight bolt handle, obviously. Um, Do you feel like that makes it easier? I feel like it made it easier. Well, yes, it actually does make it easier because I'm not having to leverage the bolt handle quite as much as I was having to do the turn. You mean down. tuck your finger up under yeah, it and then like use one finger to bring it around? You yeah, as opposed to that, I can palm. just slap it open. Well, to be fair, you're also sprung. Well, right I am also sprung, yes. Yeah, so it is technically going to go easier on that one. And after firing, it is going to be a bit rougher, See, don't get me can wrong. I that but... for, a second? for me, the difference between the two guns that really stood out was that when I was trying to shoot this one, being able to drive it so well with my palm. Palm, yeah, right and there. And push now, it. of course, it doesn't put my hand anywhere near the trigger like the other one does. I'm way out in the, the field. Oh, but yeah, you're to be out honest, in the ether. I don't know. I just I really had a much easier time driving this one than driving the other one. Yeah, you're able to get a different grip on it, which I would agree that it does help with manipulation of that guy. Yeah, I actually like straight bolts whenever possible. I think the real advantage to a turn down bolt is being able to carry it and not whack it against anything up on your back. Yeah, and so it's if good you're for not mobility. if you're not worried about snag, I like straight bolts better. I know they sure. stick out. It's weird. It's not as elegant, but the leverage is so much better to me. I would agree with that assessment on that. Also, I, mean, I can't. I can whack this one open if I need to. Can't yeah, really whack the open. The, yeah, I can't yeah. whack open a turn down that easily. Okay, so otherwise we're the we're the same. Yeah, there's not really any difference. The knurling on the safety is yeah. the same. The cocking piece. Yeah, there's not really much of a difference so between let's, them. Let's talk about shooting. Uh, shoulder up. Let's look down the sights. Where are we at? All right, we are. 
Okay, so we got like what looks like kind of a soft U notch back here instead of the deep cut V, or instead of like a deep cut V, which is unfortunate. I do prefer uh, more of a more of a come to with that. Um, but I have lost the wings that we had on the carbine at the front, so, yeah, so there is no, no question. No, and also this is a really I actually really appreciated. This is kind of a really tall front sight, and it's. I don't know, I never had trouble locating that one quickly. I, I found it very legible. Yeah, it's 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 fairly decent. And honestly, God, imagine laying down with this one instead of standing up with it like we usually do. Whew, just wondering what shots would be with that. It's fantastic. I, I do feel like the sight picture at the rear is a little flat and that it can be kind of hard to orient for just a second, but it's not critical. It's just that I think in the long run, I've learned to appreciate buckhorn style sights where they pull you into the basket. I guess I could see that. So, Something to come with time, I suppose. Yeah. I, I, with any kind of practice, this is such a natural pointer. I don't see any problem with this. Yeah, so. that's fair. All right. So uh, I guess this is where we get to the final difference because we had a problem last time. Yes. So the carbine last time, unfortunately, as we mentioned before, it, it had an issue with the trigger where we think like the sear was possibly just a little bit too worn on it. And it was causing it to release and actually fire in the single stage section, which is not great. It's not supposed to do that. That is technically DQing that rifle. So I actually did get to experience the, the two stage, how it should have felt. Now in a two stage, what's gonna happen is there's take up. Sorry, I just wanna make sure this is clear oh, to sure. people who are, Go some ahead. people are coming to this episode. Do, do you're, not, you're yeah. right there here for, for the stories and in the a, information. In a two stage trigger, you have the take up, which puts some poundage on everything. It makes sure that you know you're pulling that trigger and it hits a little wall. And then from there, it starts to behave like a normal traditional single stage trigger, which is that you hit, you get all the take up, then you start really pulling, and that's where it smoothly rocks over. And what that's done is, in the first stage, it's taken up some of the draw of the sear, it's taken up, you know, there's some motion going on, it's getting everything ready, almost like a set trigger. And then on the second part of it, it pulls and you're supposed to get this nice smooth pull. Yep. The other gun in that take up area suddenly would just release. Oh yeah. Which actually ended up working better for you because you like single stage triggers. Yeah, to be fair, that one worked out pretty great. No, this one definitely, you feel the uh, first stage of it. And you know, it's, I felt smoother, I guess, but it's not too bad. Um, it just feels like it's probably just worn with time it a little bit. It slopes into its second but stage. But it's even all the way through, so fine. And then you hit the wall. And it's a, it's a positive cliff that you feel essentially with that. But then the break from there is, it's right there. I don't want to bother discharging it right here. But no, it's the break is, it's, it's a heavy break. Nice clean break when you hit that wall. It's smooth. It feels great from there. I found it to be crystal clear. Yeah. Like, I I really appreciated the break on these guns. I thought the trigger was excellent for a two stage trigger. Mm -hmm. And then the recoil from there. Um, I don't really remember there being a significant amount of recoil with it. But to be fair, this gun is very long. It's very. It's got some fair bit of weight to it. It wasn't really too bad. And then realigning my sight from there was, Simple. it went pretty quickly. So yeah, that was pretty good. Yeah, I would consider it a fairly fast shooter. Uh, again, you have that cock on close kind of push away that I don't care for. Right. But... That's if you're trying to do something like a, 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 a rapidly load it from the shoulder. Luckily for us, we are trying to be a little more careful. So we are trying to make sure I have visual yeah. on the opening. Just to repeat, I'm sure we said in other episodes, the reason we don't work from the shoulder is we are watching the ammunition and there has to be enough pause for whoever is designated to be the brass watcher. Because we have a person off camera that's literally watching every piece of brass hit the ground to make sure that they don't see any ruptures and any other things. Yep. With old gun stuff can sneak up on you. And Especially we, with some hand loads that have uh, happened. You, you want to take had, time to be careful. We've had two fail on me. God. So just in the just in the lead up to the episode. So we want to make sure we're taking care of these things and our star when you're firing. So, oh, that is me, not the gun. I thought for sure you were talking about the gun for a second there. I was like, woo. Yes. I was talking about the gun. So... <laughs> Uh, I guess that kind of leads us to our final thing, which is always like, this is a neutral nation, so this was not in the battle until it was. <gasps> because in this episode, as you have learned, by 1919, some of these were floating around in the fight in Finland. And then, right before World War II, and yes, I would like to come back and talk more about this gun another day with some more information about sort of the World War II role, uh, but eh, we'll hedge it just a bit and say these did see combat, unlike other neutral rifles. Okay. So since these did see combat, how comfortable would you be in a World War One, maybe 1919 era fight with something like this? 
Yeah, actually, I'd, I'd feel pretty confident with this guy in terms of taking him to battle. I'm fairly accurate with it. It's also, it's got a decent cartridge to go with it to boot. And on everything else, action being as smooth as it was in the trigger, yeah, I really can't see a lot of negatives with this one other than the issues of that we mentioned that would really come with mobility with right. this guy. It's a long gun. Yeah. That's sort of its downside, is it's it's a little too long, but we've said that about so many other rifles in this war. Most rifles were too long. Yeah, and I'm not gonna doing. I'm not gonna say no to something just because of the length. The length does add to the sight radius, which is also beneficial, so hey. So let's talk about it this way. We've seen like Mauser 98's export Mausers. This kind of functions like an export Mauser. It's just that it's the Mauser 93, the cock on close. Would you put it in that same sort of category? You'd feel about as confident with this as you would a Gewehr 98? I mean, I can't see why not, other than, like, uh, it's I like I prefer the sight on this one over the Gewehr 98. Specifically. Yes. <laughs> but what about, so the export Mausers were 98 actions with the flat sights. So the sights were good on them, but they were cock on open. Would you prefer cock on open? I mean, I think cock on open's better for you if you're trying to do some, like, rapid, like, cycling of the action from the shoulders. You're going to so... make so many people mad with that. <sighs> it's okay. not... Are you in the comments? I'm sure it'll be entertaining. A lot of people find cock on close faster. That all depends on your upper body and how comfortable you are with pull push. And I think you could get pretty fast with it. I can't. I how, can't argue that that it, with practice, that's something you can become very fast with. I still ultimately think that the spring pressure fights you more on cock on close. I think you end up with more overall resistance and more sort of wear on yourself with cock on close. It does I really kind of that. feel like there is well, a lot of the cock on closes have had a lot of spring pressure to them, except for of course, you know, Lee and Lee fields are very yeah. lightly Again, sprung. We, we talked about the last episode. Yeah. Those have been amazing, surprising cock on closes. Right. Um, okay. I think that's really got us, right? There's nothing yeah. else to follow up. It's it for the sweets for the moment, isn't it? Yeah. Um, the good news is that we'll probably just go ahead and sell this now that we're done with it. There's no real yeah, reason to no keep it Yeah, there's no real reason around. why we should have and it. It's not like there's someone fuming at us off camera right now um, because she helps out <laughs> with when we're filming these main conversations. Um, or maybe she just wants me to have it. I mean, I could use it. Yeah. Uh, I'm getting glared at, so <laughs> show's over. Have a good one, guys. Bye. <laughs> Night, everybody. <laughs>